to take our Bible and open the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. They turn on him because they don't like what he's saying. He's a voice of conscience. 
and they chase him and he falls off a cliff and his brain is bust out and his head just explodes and waters carry him away to the sea. One man, one young man, likes him as a friend, his name is Ralph, and Ralph collapses in a spasm of grief and, and the book says, with filthy body and matted hair and unwiped nose, Ralph wept for the end of innocence, the darkness of man's heart, and the fall to the air of the true and wise friend called Piggy. Later, when the group is rescued, a shocked adult, a naval officer, asks how such savagery, he said, could have happened. He said, quote, I should have thought that a pack of British boys, you're all British, aren't you? would have been able to put up a better show than that. I mean, he said, outraged at what these boys had done. When we think of America today and Western civilization, many of us, I would say, are struggling to maintain our civility. We're struggling to maintain a proper gyroscope, really, in a day with flying so fast with such challenges. We, as our scripture uh, says here, every one of us comes from a background of some doubt. Yes, indeed. You say, well, I have good upbringing. My parents were strong. I was strongly raised. But please be reminded of what the scripture says. We are not beasts. We are not animals. But we are not far away from them and many of our actions. And the Bible says, indeed, we were made in the image of God. But as our verse says here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, among whom also we all had our manner of life in times past, in the lusts of our flesh. We were given to, our allegiance was to, the things of the flesh and of the world. Would you note in this verse, something we covered three weeks ago, and by the way, I want to share a word of thanks with Joel, who just sang. He preached two Sundays ago in my place. It was a blessing. And Brother Jerry, last Sunday morning, thank you, men. And we're at a delightful point in our church where numbers of our men can be useful preachers and teachers. That's something to praise God for. But here in our scripture, two weeks or three weeks ago, we looked at the word all. You know, when anybody says all or every today, many of us especially, cynical, trained types that many of us have education. By we walk around, we wonder at anything that could be so exclusive or all comprehensive as to think all as regards anything. Certainly there are exceptions. You know, the Bible says there are no exceptions. The word all is often hard to handle. But the Bible says, for instance, a key verse, we saw this, Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Oh, how we like to fight over that verse. How we love to think that we are exceptions to that verse, that somehow God would count as acceptable who we are individually, because we're different. That's one of the purposes, perhaps, of Golding's, uh, of this book here, Lord of the Flies. I think of another book that I used to make a read many years ago, was it called, I think, West Wind in Jamaica. It's about, uh, sort of like the other book, it's about some uh, families that are aboard a ship that's taken over by pirates. And the pirates kill every adult. And so the pirates on a, on a ship that they, they save, pirates and children, and the author of the book, the whole book is about how the pirates are intimidated by the kids, and the kids take over, and the kids are worse than the pirates in that famous novel. The suggestion is, where is innocence? Where is it lies? Where is goodness? We look at our society today and we wonder. And America is in trouble, but we put this word already, the word all. Then verse 3 has the next word, it says, had. You know, in many cases, the word had <laughs> is our salvation, our hope. that causes us to have reason to carry on because it refers to something that has happened in the past. The descriptors here are largely of our situation as of the past. There was some point at which all changed. And Paul says here in verse 3, 
Yes, all of this is true from verse 1. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 2, why we walked according to the devil, actually it says, according to the prince, the power of the air. And we walked accordingly, and Paul implies we enjoyed it. And verse 3, hey now today, our situation, all of us, every one of us, had our manner of life in things doubtful and horrible and outrageous to God. You know, the word all is hard for us to handle, but had is a happy word for those where it is past tense. You know, many of us have forgotten with what appreciation, why with the appreciation we felt when we first got saved. Because then we remembered what God had delivered us from. It's an amazing thing how I went through all my time in the army and hated so much of it. But then the years have made those things I hated less hateful. And I can't remember many of the things. Much of life is like that, isn't it? We have a tendency, praise God, to forget some of those things. But now, many years after being saved, we begin to forget what God has saved us from, how much we owe our God and we take it for granted. But there is blessedness in that word, past tense. We are no longer outside the family of God. Amen? We are part of the family of God. Our sins, once so mighty and so downpulling and leading to our destruction and killing, yes, killing. Our sins are no more because of the cross and the blood of Christ. The word had applies. Praise God it applies. But you know what? I want to go on. The whole business is not just about salvation. We've been preaching lately, teaching lately much about this. The whole business is not salvation. The whole business is God. But he delights in our salvation. And it's done all he can that we might be saved. And for many of us, we have trusted him. And by faith have become part of the family of God. And seen our sins forgiven. But what about our living now? Does he have as much care and interest about our living now? Well, Paul says in verse 3, the first part. Among whom also we all, speaking of himself, including himself in this, we all had our manner of conversation, our manner of life in times past, in the lust of the flesh. But it's past tense, says Paul. It is past tense. Now we live in a deadly age in many ways. I, I heard just yesterday, by the way, you know, there are big things and small things. Did you hear? Or maybe you've already got one of these. Have you got a ticket yet for jaywalking? I understand they're starting to really emphasize. Remember how they emphasized watching windshields a few years ago? And those guys out there, the squeegee guys, they got rough on the squeegee guys for washing windshields. You stop with a sign, and you have to wait for a light, they attack you with dirty water and try to scrape your windows for money. They got down on them, they got down on the graffiti. They're starting to get down on those of us who jaywalk, who walk across the street, but not at the corners. I understand the fines that police are giving are 30 buck fines. I think this is one of those 130. 130? Mercy. I didn't get one, but somebody had helped it. Any day, I'm sure. And anyways, that's one of the areas I spoke when I do end up. When the sign says don't walk, it slows me sometimes. Pastor goes, we need to pray for him. Much spiritual gain has been lost because of my crossing against the sun. I think so. But uh, I think about our characteristic thing. Don't you get a little upset when you think about Madoff? He made off with a lot of people's monies. Now, this church, we don't have to worry about that because none of us have that kind of place in life where we have any excess money to hardly invest with anybody else. Amen. Uh, we're just making it, but those blessed a little bit more, and some very worthy charities, some good people, have been ripped off in some debate. Is it 50 billion, or is it even much more? Think about that. You know, someday, other generations will look back, and probably the name Madoff will be famous for what has happened during our own era. What a sadness, what a tragedy. How about some of those that are ending up being leaders and cabinet ministers and such down in Washington lately? Isn't it an amazing thing that 
these were being put in, part of, in charge of huge budgets in our government, denied that they were aware that they owed taxes, that they would have obligation by way of their taxes, and that over quite a few years in some case. I didn't know! Please, please, I didn't know! And you know, every one of us does know, they're lying to their hats. They are thieves. My friends, we pay taxes, they should pay taxes too, amen? amen. And they should forfeit that which they're being considered for in my book. They should forfeit that for which they're being considered because of their abuse of the law, their breaking of the law. Such, right now, is our nation. May I say this? We think about all the monies flowing around and the prospects of the future, and we think, ah, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. I am full of disgust for both. I don't know about you. I think of the eight years of George Bush, and look at it. We have so little economic complaint from those eight years under the Bush administration. But the truth is that the lies and the disparagement and the laxity that is hitting home right now was really all initiated during those eight years. I'm not pleased with the progress of our recovery or what's happening in this regard, but I look at it and I'm thinking, is it true? by what we see is happening currently, and thinking of the administration before, that the heart of much of this, or a possible remedy during that period of much of this, the fault lies in the lack of the out-party group right now. There's hardly anybody without blame. Hardly anybody. In our society, in our culture today, what our other characteristics of our day? It's all me, I'm afraid, isn't it? It's really all me. The Christian, by the way, should be different. I heard of a man, he had a healthy family, a happy home. His nine-year-old boy came into him and said, Daddy, when are you and Mommy going to get divorced? <laughs> and the boy, all his friends, their families were experiencing divorce. It is so common that it seems like everybody's doing it. Well, more than half of us, and more than half of believers today, self-proclaimed believers in Christ, are divorcing at at least the equal of the weight of those in the world. <coughs> Why is it, how is it, that people of the world today are not shamed by our being different and having different statistics? You know, frankly, I'd like to look back, Lord have mercy, maybe 15, 20 years from now, and find, them, again, the world prospering, and things change. And I'd like to have some studies in hand that would show that by statistics and by real hands-on proof, that Christians were not allowing themselves to get into the mortgage situations that the world in general was getting them themselves into. That Christians realized, hey, I may well have to answer to this variable interest mortgage that five years or ten years could change the comfortable situation I'm in, and I'm therefore not going to obligate myself to something that I can foresee I'm going to have difficulty with. 